it's absolutely tipping it down outside today. There's so much rain forecast for the whole of the day. So today's gonna be an editing day. I basically break my editing down into two different parts, local and global adjustments. Local adjustments just mean changing different parts of your photo, whether it's a certain brightness range, a color range, an object or a sky. And with the latest masks in Lightroom, it's making this job so easy. Now, if you've dabbled in editing at all, you'll know what global adjustments are and you'll have probably done them as well. It's basically going through that basic slider panel and through the other panels where it's changing everything in your shot. I have some presets that do this and since building them, it has sped up the process no end. Again, I'll show you those a little bit later on and I'll show you how I actually use presets. One thing I've found is that the better the light is when I'm taking the photograph, the less editing I seem to have to do. There's less tweaking and less changing details in certain parts of the image. Whereas when the light's rubbish, you've got to do a whole lot of work to make the image usable. Now I'm going to go through a few different photos and I'm going to show you different things that I do when the conditions are different. Now here's the first photo and it's going to go from this to this. And with this one, the light is actually quite good. So I'm only going to make subtle changes, but it's amazing when you put them side by side, the difference between the before and after. So in this first one, I had the sun rising just off camera to the left hand side. There are a few lens flares that come through the shot, but I'm not too worried about that. I'm going to keep those in and I'm going to use those to add to the look that I want. I shoot in RAW, so I have a lot of detail to work with in those initial files. Also, some of the images I have bracketed, but I don't do this with all of them. If you don't know what bracketing is, I've got a video on exposure bracketing linked at the end of this video and in the description. So the first thing that I'd look at here is the histogram. You can see there's a huge lump on the shadows and then there's a bit of a lump on the highlights as well. And then if I press J, what the button J does is put colors on your image which relate to the overexposed parts and the underexposed parts. So if you look at the top here, those overexposed parts are just creeping in just by where the sun was. And then in these shadows down the bottom, there's a few blue bits. So these bits don't have much detail in. So from this, you can see why I've bracketed it. The histogram shows that as well, which I've already spoken about. But then in these next ones, you can see that sky has a lot of an exposed part in it. So if I'd have exposed for the land in this one, that sky would have been fully blown out. And then if I'd have exposed for the sky, I'm losing detail in that foreground. So that's why I bracketed it. And once you bracketed it, simple as selecting the first one, holding down shift, selecting the last one, right clicking, photo merge, HDR. That looks okay. I have auto align on, auto settings off, Got it on medium de-ghost amount. It's not really showing any de-ghosting. So I'm just gonna merge that. So now it's created a fourth image. This is the blended image. You can see up here in the loop details, hdr3.dng. So now I'm gonna work on this edit. The sky is really bright, so I wanna bring that down. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go into this mask tool, and then I'm gonna click on sky. This will basically select the sky area and it shows you that mask in red. It's not too bad. It's a bit dodgy in this area here and that area there, but I'm not gonna to worry too much about that because I'm just gonna tweak the settings ever so slightly. So I'm gonna bring the exposure down a touch on the sky, highlights down. You can see it's starting to bring a little bit of color into the sky. Whenever I'm editing skies, these are the changes I normally make. I drop the exposure down a bit, the highlights down a bit, texture down a bit and I bump the dehaze up a touch. If you really take that up, it makes it look really unnatural. So with any kind of editing, it's subtle changes. That is unless you want to go for a really grungy look or a really, really different look. Now, one thing I've noticed with Lightroom 2023 compared to all of the older versions, whenever you went into any one of these options at the top, so if I go into my masking tool, in Lightroom 2022 and older, you would have a done button down here. They've swapped that for a settings button up here. And it's really frustrating because I keep going back to that done button and it's not there. So I'll make the changes, come down here, done button's not there, so then I go up there. But that muscle memory that I built up keeps taking my mouse 
down to where that done button used to be. So it's just something I've got to get used to. So there, I've adjusted the sky and it's a very subtle difference. So you can see that's the before, that's the after. Just bringing a subtle amount of color into that sky. And here's a little tip as well. The backslash, that's a great button for switching between the two. So whenever you make edits, press and hold that. And as you're holding it, it'll show you the before, and when you let go, it'll show you the after. Or if you tap it, it'll switch to the before, tap it again, and it'll switch to the after. Then I'm gonna play around with my white balance. I look at white balance in landscape photography about how the photo feels. You can warm it up or cool it off, and you don't need to be precise, like maybe if you were shooting portraits or anything like that. Skin tones, you do need to get the white balance right. Whereas with landscapes, you can just change it to how you want the photograph to feel. Now, I shot this one with daylight white balance. So I'm just gonna warm this shot up a little bit. So I'm just gonna slide these up a touch. It's just gonna give that golden hour glow. I think I shot this a little bit after golden hour, and so it had lost that golden look to the light. So I'm just bringing it back with that white balance shift. The next thing I'm gonna do is bring up the shadows because I wanna bring up the details in this foreground, not too much, but a little bit. So if I went all the way, it'll just flatten the image out. So I'm just gonna go a little bit. I'm gonna also add to the contrast. There we go, somewhere about there. Bring the texture up a little bit and then maybe the vibrance up a little bit as well. Next, I'm gonna accentuate this corner and the lens flares just to make that side glow a little bit. So I'm gonna go into my masks again. So with this, I'm gonna go radial gradient. And from where the sun was, I'll just do that. And I'll have a graduation from where it's 100% to where it's zero. Again with this, I'm just gonna add a bit more yellow. This is just to give a bit more glow in that sky as if the sun is blasting down on this landscape. Next thing I wanna do is work on this foreground bit. There's a new thing that they've added and it's called objects. So let's see how it does with this. I kind of just paint on it randomly just to see how it copes with it. Let's see how it does there. Almost selected it all, but not quite. So I'm gonna add another object to that layer. I'm gonna paint in this bit up here. should uh, okay <laughs> so it's not really doing what i want it to so i'm just going to get a brush and sometimes with these masks they work really well other times they don't work so well so there we go so with this foreground i'm going to bring up the shadows a bit more but then add a bit of contrast and warm it up a little bit because it looked a bit too blue when it was at zero although actually that keeps it separate from the background if I make this foreground too yellow, it kind of blends in with the rest of the shot. So you do want some differentiation between the two. Now what I am gonna do is go down to color grading and with my shadows, just drop them into the blues a little bit. Not too much though, but just a touch. And then the highlights, just a touch into the yellows. I think that's it for the adjustments on that. The one thing I don't like about this is the amount of sky that's in the shot. It's a boring, flat sky. So I'm just gonna crop that out a touch. So I'm just gonna bring the top of the image down. I want that brightness and that summer feel in the shot, but then I want the scene to take the center stage, not the sky. I think I'd leave it at that. This isn't the best photo I've taken in the world, but it just shows you how much of a change you can make from one image to the next. So if I hit that backslash button, that's what it looked like to start with as a raw file, and then that's as it looks now. Now the last change I'm gonna to make to this is a bit of sharpening. I'm gonna add this with detail, and I'm gonna bring this up to about 60. That's what I normally do with all of my shots. But then what I do is hold down Option or Alt if you're on a PC, and then I'm gonna bring this mask up. So you can see the image goes white with the mask. Everything that's white will be affected. Everything that's black won't be affected. So if you have the mask at zero, every single part of that image will be sharpened. Now, if you drag this along, 
you can see it's starting to bring out the edges and the detail. And again, everything in this will be sharpened that's white, everything that's black won't be sharpened. So basically it's just sharpening the detail. That's one thing I love about this masking slider. I think it's been in the program for about five years now, but it does a really good job. It just sharpens all of the edges, but it won't sharpen your noise, it won't sharpen your flat colors. So it just makes those details stand out just a touch. One other thing you may notice as well is when I'm clicking on any of these tabs on the right hand side, as I click on one, it closes down the other. Now, if you right click on any one of these, you've got this option called solo mode. And I always use solo mode because it means that this panel on the right hand side doesn't get super long. It just stays within the confines of the screens. So solo means it just opens one at a time. So if I click on detail, it closes basic and opens up detail. If I click on HSL, closes detail, opens up HSL. The thing I find when solo mode is turned off is that very quickly you end up with all of the ones that you're working on open and you have to scroll down and scroll up. So that's just a little tip. Switch solo mode on and it'll be amazing how quickly it changes this part of the panel. Now on this first photo, it shows that when the light's good, you don't have to make too many changes. Whereas when the light's bad, you sometimes do have to make a lot of changes to bring out the best in that photograph. Now this next photo, this is in the Peak District and this is Park House Hill. I waited at this location for a good hour or so to get some kind of light on Park House Hill. You can see the clouds and the haze in the background that's pretty much what it was like. It was pretty much overcast, but there were these beams of light coming in every now and then. I did get this slither of light across the hill and then down the other side, and it's just about catching these trees, but not quite. I think if we go into Park House Hill, so you can see some of the other shots that I took. You can see the lights a bit further down the hill and a little bit earlier on see it just looked really flat. So I was just waiting and waiting and waiting and then I finally got it. Now with this photograph, the first thing I think I'm gonna do is get rid of these trees at the bottom. I'm gonna go to crop and then I'll go to 21 by nine, kind of like that aspect ratio. And then I'm gonna completely get rid of those trees. It's gonna be quite an aggressive crop I don't mind doing that. Nowadays, with the amount of resolution that you've got in these images, it's crazy how much you can actually do. This has been taken with the A7 IV, so my initial image is around about 7,000 by 5,000 pixels. So there's a lot to work with. You can see I've still got 6,000 pixels along the long edge, and then 2,600 pixels for the height. I like that crop much better. This is a kind of a, a fake pano where you crop into it. So. The next thing, that sky is really boring and flat. So I'm probably gonna actually crop it in a touch more just to get rid of that sky. And then I'm gonna make changes to the sky. So again, I'm gonna click on that mask, click on sky, let the computer do its thing and select that sky. And it's done a really good job. So again, I'm gonna bring my exposure down, highlights down, and then texture down, dehaze, now, sometimes with my edits, I'm quite aggressive with the dehaze slider when it comes to skies. It just brings out that detail. You can see this line of cloud that wasn't there before. Now, if I hold down the button to take it to before, you can see it's quite a flat sky. And now it's just brought out that detail. I'm also gonna drop down the noise because it is very grainy because I did crop in on the image. I think that'll be all right for now. That looks good. So we'll come out of that. It's very green and very flat in the foreground, but I want that to pop out. I want those different details to stand out quite a bit. I think we're gonna change the contrast. I'm gonna darken it down a touch, bring the shadows up a bit, while it's down. Now I think this one's gonna be quite a muted shot. The contrast is just pushing these shadows in the foreground down a bit. So it's kind of taking away a lot from that center of the image. So next I'm gonna to go to the tone curve. 
boost that up there a bit. Then the HSL sliders, I'm gonna show them all. Now the HSL sliders are just a way that you can target different colors or you can get rid of certain colors. I think I'm gonna work on the saturation just to bring out that grungy feel. So let's take those two down. Oh, that's interesting. As I drop the blue down, brings out a bit more detail in the sky, but I'm not sure if it's good detail. It's gone quite dappled, so I'm gonna leave that. It's amazing that sometimes you make changes, it really makes the photo worse than it was before. This is why you wanna keep an eye on what is going on in your shot. Oh, hello, there we go. It's working quite well. You can see with this one how much tweaking and tuning you actually have to do to bring out the best in the photograph. The next thing we're gonna work on is color grading. I'm gonna play around with those shadows and highlights. Whoa. Whoa. One thing I've found with this color grading panel is that if you use a mouse, it's really tricky to get the fine detailing in there. You can hold down option and then it will just make smaller changes in that with the movement that you put in in the mouse. I think we're about there. Again, that crop's not sitting quite right. I don't like this dark patch at the bottom. I want that out of the shot. Probably gonna crop in a touch more as well. Maybe we'll have it there. So you can see in my editing, I do chop and change. And as I'm making other changes, I might spot something in the shot that I don't like. And then I might go back to that other setting like I just did with the crop setting. And that's the great thing with Lightroom you can go backwards and forwards between each of the different settings. Now I'm gonna make another change. I'm gonna bring this, this will make it ever so slightly brown. So bringing a bit of that autumn feel to the shot. And then let's play around with the blue primary setting in this calibration slider. This is another thing as well. When you're editing and you're not sure what the slider is doing to your image, if you grab a hold of it, slide it all the way to one side and all the way to the other, you'll really see the changes that it's making in that image, if any. Sometimes you'll grab one, it won't make any changes whatsoever. So if you're not sure, go to the extremes just to see what it's doing and then make those subtle changes. Like I said, you can see how much more work you need to do on these images where there's less good light about. I was lucky with this one that I had that streak of light across the top. If I didn't, this would have just been a throwaway image. Now, there is one other thing I'm going to do to this. I'm going to go to detail and bring the amount up to about 60. Then I'll hold down the option button or alt on a PC, then bring this mask slider up. As I bring this masking slider up, you can see all of that noise in the sky. I don't want to add sharpening to this noise, so I'll be really aggressive with the slider and I'll take it up until all of that noise is black and not being affected by the detail panel at all. Then with the effects, just gonna add a touch of a vignette, but it's only subtle. So let's look at the before and after with this one. That's before, it's quite a flat image, flat sky. I think I brought out as much as I can in that one. So with this next image, you can see the subject is pretty much the waterfall and the bridge in the background. Whenever I'm photographing waterfalls like this, I really don't like that cappuccino look in the water. It just takes away from the shot, but I've found a way to get rid of that. And I'll show you how to do that now. This time I'm going to use the masking tool and click on subject. With any luck, this should pick out the waterfall and it has. Now I want to change the waterfall, but I don't want to change everything that it's selected. So these rocks in the middle, that rock at the back, and where else? Yeah, I suppose that's about it. Maybe this rock here. I just want to take away from that mask. So I've got the mask up here. So I'm going to click on the mask. I'm going to click on subtract. I'm going to click on the brush. 
Now what this will do is wherever I paint on this now, it will take away from the mask. Also gonna click on auto mask. This is a function that's been in Lightroom for a long time and I'll show you what it does. Uh, I need to take flow up as well. So where this rock is, I'm gonna paint on it. You can see it's kind of finding edges and it's finding things that have different brightnesses or luminosities. What that auto mask does is if you've got a contrasting edge, it'll take the mask up to that edge, but if you take the mask over it by mistake, it won't paint over it, it'll follow that line. So I tend to do this quite quickly and then I'll touch up the mask afterwards. You can see in here as well, there's lots of dots where those brighter parts of the rock stand out. I don't want the mask to paint those, so I'm gonna click on auto mask and I'm gonna paint over those. You can see that it relates to the green moss on the rock. So we'll just get rid of those last few bits. It's up here as well, and up there, and there. Now, if you think you've gone over in subtracting too much, you can press Option or Alt, and then this will paint in the bits that you want to paint back into that mask. So at the moment, I haven't made any changes. I'm just refining what the mask looks like. I think that's about where I want it. Oh yeah, this rock up here as well. So this is the trick that I do to get rid of that cappuccino looking water. So I literally get my saturation and I drop it down. I don't want to drop it down all the way to make the water look black and white. I just take the saturation down just so there's a hint of brown in the water, but a lot less than there was before. So again, if I go to the before and after, you can see it just takes away that brown color from the water. Now, let's just go through these settings as normal. I'm gonna brighten it up. I'm gonna control those highlights. Put it up there. Now with a shot like this, there's always a temptation just to bring the shadows up, drop the highlights down, and almost turn it into one of those old school, horrible looking HDR images where you've got detail everywhere. But the key with editing is to bring out the detail where you want people to look at the shot. So I've dropped my highlights down, but I've only brought my shadows up a touch. If I brought the shadows all the way up and the highlights all the way down, it does give it that kind of horrible HDR look. So I'm gonna undo those two. And I want to keep that contrast to keep the focus of the viewer in the places where I want them to look at. It's basically this stream and then the bridge in the background. So I think that's where we are with the basics. Then we're gonna come down to HSL and I'm gonna to go to saturation and just play around with these settings again. I don't want it to be too kind of garish. So if I take the greens up too much, this area in the background really pops out. These leaves and the moss on the rocks, that also pops out as well. What's orange doing? Orange isn't doing anything. Yellow is just the look of that water. So you can see that brings that brown back in the water. And that's all we're gonna do with that. I'm gonna change the sharpening and because it's a TIFF file, it does start at zero. This was a photo stack. I basically had three images. I focus on the foreground, the midground, and the background. Now, if you want to see a video on focus stacking, I did one last week. I've linked it in the description and it'll be in the playlist at the end of this video. So I think we're looking all right. Although this stick is looking a little bit too black and white. So I'm gonna go back to this mask and I'm going to subtract brush. I'm gonna brush over it. Although it does look quite a black stick. So there's not that much color in it anyway. Now, when you're in any one of these tools and you want to zoom in on the shot, you could go up to the navigator bar up here and click on 167 or however much you want to zoom in. The easier way to do this is hold down space bar and then it changes your cursor to the magnifying glass and then you can zoom in. Then when you let go of space bar, it brings the tool back to where your mouse is. So it's just a quick way of being zoomed in and seeing the whole image. So let's go back to where we were. So we've added a bit of detail. 
Again, I'm gonna put a mask on that detail because I don't want everything to be sharpened. And let's go down to calibration. Now with this blue primary slider in the calibration tab, this is almost like an autumn slider. So if you've missed the autumn and you haven't had the chance to go back to get the leaves when they're in their prime colors, if you actually slide this down, it does give an autumn feel. It's not brilliant and it's not the best, but you can kind of fake it a little bit. What I tend to do is just bring the hue slider down a touch and then the saturation slider down a touch more. Now, if you really want that autumn feel, if you take the red primary up, and the blue primary down, it kind of gives an autumn feel, but again, it's quite a fake autumn feel. So what I like to do is just take the blue primary down a bit on hue and down a bit more on saturation. It just mutes those colors and takes it a touch more towards autumn. One last thing, I'm just gonna put a vignette on this. This just darkens the edges just a touch. I don't wanna go that vintage look, but I'm just gonna add a subtle vignette. So it just darkens those edges down a touch. So I almost darkened it down a bit too much. I'm gonna bring that back up. Highlights down a touch more. I think that's there for that one. Looking at it, it does look a lot different to the last edit I did on this image for the video where I went for this walk. It's amazing if you go back to your images, how different the edit can end up. And this is one thing I really encourage you to do. If you've edited your images and you think you've finished with them and you're thinking of getting rid of the raw files, just keep the raw files of the images you really like. And then after about a year, go back to them, wipe the edits that you did on them and start again. And then compare the two images. It's amazing the difference between the two. Now, I edited these back in September. It's November now, so it's only two months and I'll put them side by side on the screen now. The one on the left was the one that I edited in September, and then this shot is what I edited this month in November. Now, when you want to remove objects from your frame, you can use the healing tool in Lightroom, and it works quite well on things like this sign, but when there's not much that it can sample from, it struggles quite a bit. So with this photograph of the tea shop in Tlanwurst, I've got this signpost here, I've got this bush in the foreground, and I've also got the tea room gallery signpost as well, which is really distracting. And also someone's on the bridge taking a selfie. So they're the things I want to get rid of to make the house the focus of this photograph. Also, it was an overcast day and the sky is quite boring. So again, I'll try and bring some detail out in that. The healing tool, when you click on the clone mode, great at getting rid of things like this but you have to select where it's taking that image from so if we go there and click away it's done quite a good job because that edge of the bridge is nice and straight I can use that clone tool whereas where this woman is if I try and get rid of her going to struggle and to try and find any kind of details that gets rid of her kind of messes it up so that doesn't work well at all. This is where we go across to Photoshop and the healing tool in Photoshop is so much better. I'm going to right click on the image, edit in, edit in Adobe Photoshop. Now like I've said in previous videos if you're intimidated by Photoshop just approach it with individual tasks in mind in a kind of modular way. I'll show you how to get rid of objects like this now, and it's really simple. There are a few different tools that you can use, and they're really effective in getting rid of these different things. In Photoshop, I don't like how all of the tools sit on the opposite side to the layers. So I'll grab this from the left-hand side and then drop it over onto the right-hand side. So all of my tools and layers and everything else are over here on the right-hand side. You don't have to do this, but I prefer customizing the layout in this way. The tools I'll be using today are the Spot Healing Brush Tool and the Clone Stamp Tool. And if you hold your cursor over each of these tools or any of the other tools, it gives a little explanation of each one. And you can click on the Learn More to see exactly how each one of these tools works. 
So I'm going to start off with this signpost here. So I've got the healing tool selected. Let's see how it does with this. It's almost done it, but it's not quite keeping that straight edge. So what I'm going to do is go to the clone tool and I'm going to clone a bit over here. So I'm going to click on option or alt on a PC. Actually, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to select that. You can see where I selected it up there. It's holding like a ghost part of that image. So I'm going to line up the edge of the bridge and click on that. And there you go. That gets rid of that completely. Let's see if we can get rid of this woman. All I'm doing is just painting away. I made a mistake. See, she's appearing there. So all I'm doing is holding option and sampling that bit. And you can see where the cross is, where it's sampling from. Now the problem is where you click on the sample, then you come paint over. Let's say our sample from here, I paint up here, and all of a sudden it's painting the edge of the bridge. So you've got to be really careful when you are sampling from different parts of it. But that's pretty much got rid of her. And just by using the clone tool and just being precise in where I took that sample from. So the next is this bit here. I'm going to use the content aware fill with this. And if that doesn't work, I'll use that together with the healing tool and the clone tool. So first of all, I'm going to get my lasso tool. I'm just going to draw around this. This is just going to put the dotted lines around that. Next, I'll go edit content aware fill. Basically with content aware fill, wherever it's green on this, that's where it's sampling the bits from. And then down here is the preview of that image. So if we go across to that corner, it's okay, but it's not brilliant. Now I'm going to take away from this sample. Every time you take bits away from the sample, it recalculates those bits of content that it's filling. You can see it jumps around as you take bits out. Right, that's not brilliant, but what I'm going to do is come out of that, clicking OK, and then I'm going to use my other tools to refine that mask. Now what it's done is just created this mask by sampling different parts of the image. It's put that into the area that I selected. So what I'm going to do now is flatten that image. So I've got the background selected, so I'm going to hold down Shift and click on Background Copy, right click, and merge layers. This is just basically flattened those two layers so they're not separate layers. And I'm going to go Command D or CTRL D if you're on a PC. So it's taken away that selected area. Now I'm going to refine this because you can see we've got this zigzaggy line there. There's a fuzzy bit all around on the edges. I'm going to use the clone tool for this. So I'm going to come up here, hold down Option or Alt, click there. And then I'm going to paint in this edge. And literally, I'm just going to paint along here. Not doing a very good job there, actually. And this is what I mean with that clone tool. You've got to be really wary of where you're sampling from. Because we've got this fuzzy bit here, it kind of stands out to me and it doesn't look natural. So I'm going to take these ripples here and put them down here. So I'm going to select my clone stamp tool. I'm going to select there. I'm going to come down to here. Now, as you use this clone healing tool, you'll see a cross and a circle. The cross is where the sampling is from, and the circle is where the clone tool is pasting the sample to. You can see with the clone tool, it's just a case of trial and error. If it doesn't look right, undo the command by clicking on Command Z or CTRL Z on a PC. This will undo that last task. I just keep going back and forth with a clone tool and a soft edge brush selected until it looks good. So we've got rid of the post, we've got rid of the woman, we've got rid of this thing. 
also in here it's a bit fuzzy there as well so uh, take something from here put it there there we go so in that that's a bit fuzzy there as well cool that's all right with the tea room sign once again i'll use the clone stamp tool I'll sample the trees in the background and then paint over it. I tend to click in little bits of the sampled parts and this stops the tool from recloning the sign I'm trying to cover. The thing with this is it's a chaotic pattern and so there's no standardization or there's no symmetry to it. Adding to that chaos makes it look more natural. Again, up here, because I cloned all the way up, there's almost like a pattern forming. So if I grab, let's say this branch here by holding option and then putting bits like that in it, it just breaks up that pattern. trunk is looking a little bit too uniform and we've got this post as well there we go so now we've got that edit and it saved it as a tiff file so you can see we've got the original name edit.tiff which is basically this one with all of those things removed now it's a case of just editing this image. I don't like the sky, so I'm gonna make the changes like I've done in all of the other images. So drop down my exposure and the highlights, drop the texture a bit, and then bring up the dehaze quite a bit. Don't wanna go too far, just to bring out that detail a touch in the sky. Now I have spotted a dust spot just above the tree. So you can see that there. So I'm going to use the healing tool for that. I should get rid of that. Now I'm just going to play around with these basic sliders to bring out the details. Again, I'm making it more contrasty because it was overcast and it was flat light. So you really want contrast in this. You can increase the contrast by using the contrast slider, but you can also use it by using the white and the black slider. Now, here's another tip. If you hold down Option or Alt on a PC, when you're using the white and black slider, it'll show you when the highlights are being blown out. You can see it's in the sky, which is the brightest part. So what I tend to do is take it just so, it's maybe showing a few pixels of blue. The same with the blacks. It'll show where it's losing detail. You can see it's under that bridge, which is the darkest part of the image. So now, one thing I don't like, I should have spotted earlier, was this straight edge. So if we go transformation, guided, if I draw a line following that edge, and then I draw a line following the edge of the house here, see it's just made those two vertical. So when you're taking the photographs, if you had the camera tilted back or tilted forward a bit, those vertical lines will become skewed one way or the other. And the guided tool is a fantastic tool to get rid of this. Now I quite like this image, but that sky is just so horrible and flat. Might tweak it just a touch more. There's not really much you can do with it. The one last thing I'm gonna do is see if a vignette helps. This will just darken down the river, darken down these two edges, really emphasize these brown trees and the red tea house. So let's look at the before and after. Well, really, it should be the before all of the work with that tree in the foreground, the sign, this signpost and that woman, and then the after. Sometimes you might get to a location where you miss that good light or it's not lighting as you wanted it to on part of the frame. So with this shot at Klinadoachen, the sun had dropped down just behind the hills on the right hand side of the frame and where this old farmhouse was, that had gone into shadow. Now this can happen quite often when you're chasing that light. In this case, 
I'd come around, I shot this. This was a six image pano, but the light had come off this house. But I know that I can bring the details back in that foreground and I can get it quite close to what it looks like where the sun's on it. Not exactly the same, it will look a bit different, but I can get it closer than what it is in the raw file and what it would be in a JPEG file. Also, the sky's really bright. I think I blew this sky out. Yeah, if I hit the J button, it shows all of that red bit. That's the blown out bit of the sky and you can see in the shadows, it's losing details in these parts in that old farmhouse. So there's a lot of work to do to this, but with a bit of creative editing, we can bring it back. So we're gonna start on the sky. And you can see with all of these edits, I tend to start with the most awkward part of the image. And a lot of the times it is the sky. So I'm gonna bring the exposure down, highlights down, texture down, dehaze up. Can I bring any detail back in that? Nope. There really is a lack of detail in that area there. But when you make mistakes like that, there's a way of working around that and kind of emphasizing that bit as well. And I'll show you that a little bit later. But that's as much as I'm gonna do with the sky for now. I'm gonna bring these shadows up next. It's just a case of bringing this slider up. But straight away, you can see that part of the image was in the shadows. Now, what it's also shown is these two red boxes. Again, we're gonna get rid of those in a little bit with the healing tool. And I'm gonna carry on working on these shadows. Right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is use local adjustments in this area here. So, I'm gonna use the brush tool. So, brush, auto mask on. If you see this edge here, it's gonna follow that edge but not go over it. Might get confused where these grassy patches are, but the rest of the time, it's gonna follow that edge. And we're gonna come out into the shadows here and follow that edge of the shadow. And then hopefully it'll follow these yellow plants here. So that's basically what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna turn auto mask off and I'm gonna fill in the gaps. And I'm gonna hold down option to take away from this mask and just paint in that window because I've got sunlight there already. Then I'm gonna paint in this tree here and actually probably this mountain here as well. So again, I'm gonna bring up the shadows in this part. Turn the contrast down a touch. So there's that. So I'm gonna have a new mask and it's gonna be a brush again. I'm gonna feather the edge to 100. Flow is gonna go down to around about 50. What I'm gonna do is bring up the shadows and the highlights. Auto mask is off. I'm gonna brighten up different parts of the image. So if you look here, all of this grass, the top edges are really bright, the bottoms are really dark. So it's quite a contrast between the tops and the bottoms. And I'm just gonna try and create that on these bits of grass in the shadows. And also on the top of the walls. the edges of this one. Ooh, that doesn't look that good. That area doesn't look good. You see, I've come over this area, so it's highlighting that background. That's when a photo starts to look like it's been edited, as opposed to you just bringing out the best in the image. I think that's the layer beneath it. It's this one. So with this brush, I'm just gonna take away this bit in here, this bit here, this bit in here, and there. That looks a little bit more natural now. What I'm gonna do is warm this up as well. You can see where those bits are that I'm affecting. So that's it for that. I'm gonna increase the contrast now of the whole image, increase the exposure. Now, with that blown out part in the sky, I'm gonna create another mask. It's gonna be a radial gradient. It's basically gonna be from where that is. It's gonna be a pretty big one. And it's just 
going to be a yellow glow from that area. So it looks like there's loads of golden hour sunlight being thrown out onto the scene. I'll probably take that out a bit further. Take this a bit further down. You can see here, if we get rid of that, this area here looks like there's sunlight hitting it, whereas before, dark and horrible. So you can see the difference. The one last thing I'm going to get rid of are these buckets. Let's see how it does it. So my computer's struggling with this one a little bit. You can see if you look at the size of the image, this is 10,400 pixels by 5,800 pixels. So it is a big image. With the healing tool, you can change between content aware remove, which is a new one, heal and clone. So I'm gonna try content aware remove just to see what that does. That's actually done a pretty good job. And actually where this other one is, I'm gonna change that to content aware remove as well. That's done a much better job. And I think we're there on that one. That was a very tricky one to edit because of those shadows in the foreground, but I've brought out as much detail as I can in that foreground. And this little hill just to the left of where I took the shot, that looks like the sunlight's hitting it. This yellow gorse bush in the foreground, that looks like the sun's catching it as well. So it's almost creating the illusion that the sun is on the scene still. With this next image, it's a close up of these leaves. I think this one is sharp. Yep, I've got good detail in that leaf. It kind of stands out and it really screams autumn, but there are a few distracting things in it. I'm not gonna do a big edit on this one. and I'm actually gonna use some presets. Now, when presets first came out, I really hated them. But then after a while, I found that I was adding similar global edits to similar looking images. So I ended up building my own presets and I use them all the time. However, it's got to the point where I can't remember exactly how I got to those colors in the first place. Although with presets, all Lightroom is doing is moving around those sliders on the right hand side. So if you do have any presets or if you're wondering what the built-in presets do or you bought a preset pack, you can look through any of the settings just to see what they've actually done. The main thing to understand with presets are that they're a starting point for your photograph. So the first thing I do is go through the list of presets that I have. So I've got my 16 presets. So I'll literally just hold the mouse over them and see which one looks good. Bright Grunger looks quite good. Winter is here, looks a bit dark. But I can brighten that up because again, it's that starting point. Black and white doesn't work on it. Autumn is here is quite good. Yeah, that's a bright grunger. Bring the exposure up a bit. And I'll go to HSL again. Select that background. That's dropping that background a lot, making those leaves stand out. But then this out of focus area has made it look really weird. So I need to fix that. Let's try calibration. Oh, that, there we go. So that's gotten rid of it. And we've lost that outline that was looking strange. What you find with digital images, when you've got something that's out of focus and you edit it a little bit too much, it tends to emphasize the outline of that out of focus bit. But the blue primary slider in calibration, that seems to have lessened that effect. Kind of like that, but these branches down the bottom are a little bit distracting. So I'm gonna go for a one by one crop. Maybe put it there somewhere. That looks quite nice. Maybe up a bit, there we go. Yeah, I kind of like the look of that. Bit different, very autumn -y. very, very orange. There's nothing but deteriorating leaves in this shot that are going really orange, but it does scream that autumn vibe. With this photograph that I took at the Havard Estate in Mid Wales, I originally thought it was a dud and I was gonna scrap the image. 
But after putting a few different presets on it and after playing around with the settings, it actually came out all right. And I'm actually really surprised that this is one of the ones that I like the best out of those shots that I took at the Havard Estate. Now, sometimes I like to underexpose my shots and sometimes I like to overexpose my shots. So with my preset pack, I've got different things. So I've got an overexposed version of all 15 shots and then an underexposed version of all 15 or 16 shots. So you can use the presets as starting points, but you've also got different starting points to start from. I just like those subtle edits, but also sometimes you can be really aggressive with the edits and really make them stand out or make them very different to what the image started. So if we go to before on this, this image looks really flat. And then afterwards, it's grungy, it stands out, and it screams autumn. And I don't know how many times I've said it screams autumn in this video, but you know what I mean. Anyway, that's enough about presets. I have them on my website. So if you like the look of these, then head over to there and pick yourself up a pack. And if not, no worries. Hopefully I've shown you enough in this video to get some good edits of your own. Now, if you have any questions, comment below. This is where I hang out a lot of the time and I really enjoy replying to your comments and having some kind of interaction with you guys that are watching. Now, if you want to see how I captured these images, click on this playlist next and do a bit of binge watching. Mm -hmm.